I am very happy to be able to welcome Professor Jeffrey Leach uh, at our Fred Jelinek series of uh, lectures. I think I don't need to introduce, and actually this is the biggest ever audience we have had for Fred Jelinek's series of lectures. So I think this by itself indicates that Professor Jeffrey Leach is our most welcome guest, and that we are really happy that he could uh, accept our invitation. Actually, I also should say that uh, this is not the only purpose of his stay in Prague, but in addition to another lecture we will have tomorrow at the conference at, at the Faculty of Philosophy, uh, the most outstanding uh, event of this week for us and for Professor Leach will be his promotion as the Honorary Doctor of Charles University on Thursday afternoon uh, in Aula of Carolina. Uh, so, without an official uh, curriculum vitae, I would like to mention here one event or one, uh, one thing which I, I suppose characterizes both Professor Leach and his relations to us. To us. It's a kind of personal, a piece of personal memory, of my personal memory. Uh, Professor Leach uh, wrote a very nice introduction to semantics. And the book was published in 1974. And on page, sorry, on page 59, there is an extract from uh, newspapers. Uh, which is uh, introduced by a small paragraph. It's a, um, uh, it's a, it's a piece of, uh, this is a part of a, a chapter which is called Position. And the introductory paragraph uh, looks like this. A more extensive illustration will be provided by the following paragraph from a leaflet dropped on Czechoslovakia by the Warsaw Pact authorities at the time of their military takeover of the country on August 21st, 1968. And there is a quotation from uh, the leaflet. Uh, this is not the end of the story, as you can suppose, because in 1975, Professor Leach was supposed to come to Prague and Brno and Bratislava, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on an exchange visit organized by the British Council. And uh, shortly before that visit, uh, Professor Jan Firbas from Brno called me and said, please come, come immediately to Brno. And so I went to Brno, which wondered what had happened because I traveled to Brno every second month for some discussions on topic focus articulation. And at that time, I, uh, uh, I was told by Professor Firbas that if the visit of Professor Leach is endangered because some good colleague uh, read this book and pointed out that this chapter to some somebody somewhere and the invisible eyes uh, said oh such a person cannot come to Prague or to Brno I cannot give a talk fortunately Professor Leach did come it was quite a courageous trip actually because he got the visa as I learned today only at the Prague airport uh, but this is even this is not the end of the story, because we told the story uh, to Professor Leach when he was in Prague and you know, when he was in Brno, and he then recognized what he what he did. And at that time, we didn't have the book. So when Professor Leach came back home, he sent me a copy of the book, 
but this page 59 and 60 was missing. <laughs> Professor Leach was so nice as to understand the problem and he didn't want to endanger us, so he just threw out the page. I must say that I am very, very sorry that somehow I, at that time, I didn't understand the, uh, I don't know what to say, the importance of the moment, and I bought another copy afterwards to have the page. And I threw out that wonderful copy without the page. So that's the end of the story. So I think this is a wonderful illustration, uh, not to speak about other books we got from Professor each, this comprehensive grammar of English and grammar of English, etc., etc. So our contexts are very long, very fruitful for us, and I am really happy that Professor Leach is with us and will give us a talk. Please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eva, for that very nice introduction. Can people hear me? Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, I want to say, begin with a few words about Fred Jelinek, after whom, in memory of whom, this series of lectures are held, uh, is held, I should say. Um, well, I can't pronounce his name very well in, in Czech, so I just call him Fred Jelinek, which is what everybody used to call him when I knew him. And um, of course he was a brilliant engineer, he was a language technologist and a brilliant statistician. And I got to know and admire him in the later 1980s when he was at IBM's research centre in New York State. In some ways he was not an easy man to work with, but he made the decision to fund our research at Lancaster um, for three or four years, and for that I was very grateful indeed. We were building tree banks. Tree banks, I suppose you people in this uh, institute know them very well, and from your own superb work in that field. And of course, he championed the need for corpus-based natural language processing. For a long time, he was regarded as an outsider by the computational linguistics community because he was data heavy and theory light, whereas they were mostly theory heavy and data light, I think. And uh, eventually, of course, his approach won the day and uh, computational linguistics was converted to his point of view. So I pay that great tribute to the man in whom, uh, after whom this series of lectures is, is named. And I last met him here in Prague, in my last visit to Prague in 2002, I think. Yes. Um, well, I'm afraid my contribution to this series does not relate closely to his work or even to the current work of the Institute here. After retirement, I retreated from NLP to Corpus Linguistics which of course has a core of NLP in it. One of my main research interests today is in what Manfred Krug called brachychronic linguistics, short-term diachronic linguistics, comparing or using comparable or matching corpora. And this is of course dealing with the recent history of language using a corpus, often um, a distance of a few years uh, a decade, several decades, but not taking the great panorama of history, which is what diachronic linguistics has traditionally done. So, I hope you'll find this talk interesting, although it may not relate very closely to your own research interests. And the topic I'm going to take today is on why things seem to decline and perhaps eventually disappear in language. Why do features of language change? Of course, a lot of attention is always paid to new developments in the language, the way new items are created and the way they spread through the language. But very little attention has been given to the way things disappear, decline and perhaps disappear. So I want to have a look at those things, looking at the very relatively recent history of English. 
I'm going to focus here <coughs> on corpus evidence for decline in frequency and some likely reasons for decline in frequency and the mechanisms of change themselves see what we can learn from using corpora for this purpose and I have a lot of acknowledgements to make to colleagues um, who have worked with me on this area of corpus linguistics in the last 20 um, no, last let's say 12 or 14 years um, I don't have a list of references for people to read but I'll just give one reference which is this book that I together with some colleagues uh, published in 2009 on change in contemporary English right now the evidence is mainly using what are known what is known today as the brown family of corpora comparable corpora of American English and British English at roughly 30 year intervals uh, it all began way back in the 1960s with this well-known corpus the brown corpus was the first electronic corpus of English or perhaps even of other languages to be created and um, in Lancaster we started an, a matching corpus of British English so this was originally just a synchronic comparison between two varieties of English in the 1960s and then because that was the beginning of using, corp using uh, computers to study language we could only manage to produce a corpus of a million words which sounds a lot but actually is quite small by present day standards and uh, it was all written data because in those days it was very difficult to store sp spoken language in any form on the computer and then about 30 years later uh, the people at Freiburg University in those days Christian Meyer and Marianne Hunt decided to create a new generation of matching corpora so they were designed to be completely uh, as precisely as possible uh, equivalent in the way they are sampled and the way they are structured equivalent to these corpora here so we then had a nice quartet of corpora and since we like to use the family metaphor uh, being a generation apart we called them the nuclear family if you like a fam this a small family of corpora since then this nuclear family of these four corpora has extended in various ways um, not very systematically really there's a corpus that we built at Lancaster called uh, before Lob or blob for short 1931 um, we even started one for 1901 and uh, later on these yellow corpora here a colleague of mine Paul Baker at Lancaster uh, built those but he used simply the web he, he managed to collect a corpus which was in every respect uh, similar identical to these except for the period of in this case 15 years later using the web as a source of data now there might be some questions about whether this is as closely comparable to the other corpora because of that fact that it, they were data collected from the web which uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they were in all senses equivalent but we do find them we haven't found any reason not to trust them as a good um, a representation of the written language of that recent period and then these, these green ones here they are incomplete but we managed to use this one a little bit because we can sample across the whole uh, range of texts up to a third we haven't got really more than a third that we can play with but that's something that can usefully be used even though the, the amount of data is rather small and so this is what these corpora are made up of 
Um, we tend to divide them into 15 genre categories. There are 500 tech samples, 15 genre categories, and four subcorpora, as we call them. For most purposes, we don't really want to go to a more delicate stage of genre categories. We just talk about press, general prose, which is uh, non-fiction prose writing learned or academic and fiction. So those are the main categories. Fairly broad range of written language. And so we try to use these as representative in some sense of the written lang English language of their period. Of course it will be the standard language because they are written a form, a written form and, and in fact they are published materials. So in that sense they are only dealing with written standard English. Now, just to give you a flavour of what English was like at the beginning of the period we're dealing with, which was 1901, I just give you a short sentence to give you the, that feeling. It's not the kind of English we would find very frequently today. The second purse shown here is knitted with some of Messrs. Pearsall's twisted silk upon which beads of a suitable colour have been threaded. Um, while you take it in, I'll just explain that this is a, a text from a category dealing with skills, trades and hobbies. And I don't think anybody would publish a book um, of dealing with um, how to I think it's, it's, it's something to do with knitting or, uh, yes, knitting. It's a, bit, a kind of knitting guidebook, if you like. And I don't think the same style would be used today. Um, one of the things that I come back to is that the, the passive is used here. And the passive is one of the phenomena which has been declining and which I'm going to talk about further. Um, this form method is a, a bit odd. It's the plural of Mr., which I don't think would be used today. Um, upon, as a preposition, has declined a great deal since that time. And again, we have another passive. So, <coughs> you might consider this a matter of style. You could, I can't point to any features of syntax there which do not exist today. But nevertheless, the, the, the character of the, of the, the English language has changed considerably over that hundred years. And we're interested in studying it then, <coughs> primarily in terms of loss of frequency. That's what I'm looking at today. <coughs> And the six case studies, I hope I have time to deal with, deal with all six of them. Uh, <coughs> first of all, the preposition upon. Secondly, the conjunction for. Thirdly, the passive voice. Fourthly, WH relative clauses. Fifthly, modal auxiliaries. And sixthly, prepositional phrases. <coughs> Have a look at these. They're all on the decline <laughs> and have been for some while. But some of them, of course, are very much more frequent than others. And uh, so they, they'll show this. No, they'll show this phenomenon of decline in a somewhat different way between them. Let's start off with a pawn, and this is the kind of chart which I'm going to show you. Um, the blue line is. Um, the British English, because actually we have got five data points with the British uh, cor corpora. Uh, we've got um, 1901. I had to scale this up to 100% from about 33%, but let's say it's approximately correct. Then we have um, 1931, 1961, 1991. And of course, this 2006 is only separated by 15 years, so because I was not very clever with uh, PowerPoint, I couldn't find out the way to cut the space here, but I hope you'll be able to uh, imagine that this is only half the distance of that and that. Okay, so you can see how um, a pawn has declined almost to become a rarity in present day English from being very common. This figure simply tells us 
the number of occurrences per million words. So it's a rough and ready measure, really, of the extent to which these words are, this particular word is used in the present and in the recent past. Um, now, one of the things I noticed when we studied the poem was that today it's very frequently used in what one could describe as idiomatic or fixed expressions, or what I call here lexically bound. That is to say, a poem is bound to another word in some sense of being bonded to it in terms of frequency. So, um, if you call upon, uh, the use of a pawn there is connected with the fact that it's in this prepositional verb construction pre to call upon. And similarly here, decided upon, the verb goes with the preposition. It's, it's also possible to say call on and decide on, but somehow the preference is to use a pawn in these fixed expressions. And you notice again uh, with impact upon and of course you take these, these are very much the, at the fixed end of the scale, the fixed expressions where it's very difficult to use the simpler preposition on, once on a time doesn't occur, I think. And Stratford upon Avon again is conventional because it's in the name of the place. Um, there are also lexically free uses, as I would call them, where the use of a pond doesn't seem to be connected with any particular uh, fixed expression. We have an example here, upon this point, the British policy has never altered. Okay, so <clears throat> when I plotted the frequency of a pond, here in this, we're talking from 1931 to 2006, and this is British English. Um, when I plotted this, and I also plotted the number of lexically bound uses, you see that th there's a large predominance of the lexically bound uses. And on the whole, that proportion of lexically bound uses increased. The lexically free ones are just the ones in this short, uh, this narrow gap here. So, one theory is that when, when linguistic forms decline, it's because they get more and more uh, restricted to fixed expressions in some, some sense. They become lexically governed rather than syntactically governed. Well, I thought that was a very good argument until I found that here there's a slight increase in the amount of proportion of lexically bound forms in 2006. So that, that was a, a pity, a pity from my point of view. Okay, so that's one idea. <coughs> Um, now another way to look at this, instead of just counting the occurrences per million words, is to look at the proportion of um, upon, comparing it with the preposition on, which you can think of as a variant of the same variable. You say there's a variable here, including both on and upon. Upon is perhaps a more formal and weighty preposition but in general you can substitute one for the other without too much difficulty. And so if you do it that way you get a slightly different picture but the message is the same. In red we see a hundred, uh, this is the proportion of apons over 10% in 1931 but very much lower than 5% in 19, in 2006. So in that sense, a pond can be clearly seen to be on the decline compared with its uh, alternate form of on. And on, as we see, actually increases in frequency, that, and that also is in a sense shown by this diagram. <coughs> Now I'm going to another word, word for, um, which of course 
is frequently used as a preposition in English, but in this case we're looking at for as a conjunction. <coughs> and two examples here. This is from Bob, which is 1931. A pri proprietary remedy should be used, for this is better than any homemade one. Um, for here is a conjunction subordinating, normally considered a subordinating conjunction, but its status as a subordinator is somewhat unclear because it can only follow the matrix clause. You couldn't, for example, begin this first sentence with four. Four, this is better than any homemade one. But on the other hand, if you use because as an alternative uh, causative conjunction, then you could begin the sentence with because. With this one, this is rather interesting, four seems to have become more independent, uh, as if it can introduce a new sentence as in this example, for how is the good citizen to be defined, blah, 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 okay. Um, and this shows that parrot 4 has been moving more to paratactic rather than hypotactic linkage. So, in that sense, it's a somewhat unusual um, subordinator or uh, uh, subordinating conjunction. And here's a picture of the way 4 has declined from 1931 onwards, right the way down here. This is British English, and for American English we don't have the earlier corpora yet, so we can only measure the decline over uh, this last 50 years or so, but nevertheless you can see the picture is very uh, clear that decline is taking place and it's taken place very steeply indeed in almost getting to the stage where four is an archaism perhaps it's, it's so this use is so limited now I thought it was possible that four is declining Part of the reason, at least, for the decline of four might be that other causative conjunctions are increasing and somehow taking over the use of four. And so I looked at because, and this is the most common uh, causative conjunction in English, I think, and, whoops, sorry. Uh, so what we find here then is that because has indeed increased over the last um, hundred years or so very steadily it seems to be increasing more steeply towards the end of the period and um, one possible reason for that is the process known as grammaticalization which diachronic linguists have written a lot about and theorized a lot about the process whereby um, originally lexical um, combinations have become reduced to some sort of grammatical function. In this case, um, you think of because as ultimately coming from by cause, okay, by cause of. Um, I mean, I'm not into the history of it now, and this takes us back hundreds of years to Middle English, but that process of grammaticalization, of getting reduced into a single form, has continued, and we often find in speech these days that it is pronounced as a, as a monosyllable. In fact, as a reduced monosyllable, just because. Um, I know Marie likes me because she told me. That's a very common way of saying it in present day English. And, and of course, if you transcribe it, often it gets transcribed by this single syllable cause. And that's a, an indication of further grammaticalization. It's also <coughs> a signal that perhaps because is used more in speech than in writing. And indeed, we did find that to be the case. It's much more common in speech than it is in writing. And given that spoken forms of the language tend to 
uh, extend themselves into the written language over time, a process which we call colloquialization, whereby the written language adopts spoken language habits, then we also expect this increase to affect the written language. And so this evidence provides this provides evidence of that. Um, now, because, of course, can be used at the beginning of a sentence as an introductory uh, conjunction with the subordinate clause preceding the matrix clause, and so you could get, because they were so large, she felt, felt a bit afraid of the griffin. Uh, you can put it that way <coughs> in English. But, because it's getting more and more to be the kind of conjunction that follows the matrix cause. The number of cases of because preceding the matrix cause is rather small. And so that's another reason for thinking that because is somehow taking over the function and the territory of four. And this just shows a, the same sort of picture, which showing that American English is on the same track, but a little bit higher up in uh, the increase of because. Um, again, we only have got the three data points for American English, so we don't quite know what the picture was before that. But we very often find that American English is somehow leading the way, somehow the, the, the British English is following the same track, but somewhat uh, behind the American tendency. If you like, we are more conservative in the old country. And this is another picture of a similar kind. This is showing us because, and it's also the abbreviated form cause, um, that this is actually from the British National Corpus, um, which contains spoken material. So we have a 10 million word subcorpus, which is the spoken data of the British National Corpus. And on part of that, the so-called demographic part, uh, which is really English conversational style and dialogue, um, we can actually find out the ages of the people who are speaking in most cases. And so we can we can draw this graph representing what is called apparent time. That is to say, not it's not really diachronic, but it tells you in terms of ages of people what their usage of the particular feature we're studying is. And we see that older people are using because less than younger people, right? So when we get to starting off with people who are 60 plus and going up to a peak at 20, 15 to 24 and it comes down a bit dealing with uh, people from 0 to 14, children and now I'm not sure how to explain that but it could be simply a, a, a limitation of the corpus British National Corpus was not really collecting material from children it was meant to represent adults and children only came in insofar as they were talking to adults who were using this recording device and so it's a little bit unreliable as representing the, the character of children speaking so, if we conveniently forget about that one, uh, we can see the general picture of increase in the use of because represented by the ages of the people um, and how that, that usage has increased with younger people are. Um, the yellow line simply represents the whole of because plus the reduced version represented in dialogue as cause. We don't really know how much to rely on that because, of course, it was a decision made by transcribers who are often not particularly uh, professional to represent it either as because or cause. But the picture is quite interesting because we see a regular decline in the use of because. So in spoken language, the full form because is decreasing 
but the reduced form cos is increasing up here, which of course is a sign of further grammaticalization, because grammaticalization often shows, it, shows itself in a phonetic reduction and the merger of forms. And so the yellow line shows the complete picture of because plus uh, cos. Okay, so that, that's a kind of theory, or a hypothesis if you like, that 4 is declining in part because of the increase of, of because, and this picture simply represents them both together. Here's the line of because, here's the line of 4, this is still British English, by the way. And um, another uh, causative conjunction, since, when it's used as a causative conjunction, also increasing. And another one, as, which is not increasing particularly. So we go to four different conjunctions, which are to some extent, or considerable extent, overlapping in their function. And it's interesting to see whether we can explain the decline of four in terms of the increase of other conjunctions. Well, it doesn't quite work out numerically, as you probably see from the diagram here. Uh, the decline of four is more uh, extreme than it would represent by the, the increase of because and of since. But at least there seems to be some reason for that being part of the explanation of four. Um, now we move over to my third topic of decline, which is the passive, the B passive in English. Um, this diagram, sorry, this, this, this table simply represents a small part of the total picture. It's what's happening to British and American English between 1961 and 1990. Well, 1992 in this case, 1991, that, that's an insignificant difference. So we're just looking at 30 year, 30 year change in the use of the passive in British and American written English. And we see that there's a decline of 20% in Amer American data and slightly less, 12.4% in the British English data. So this represents a very typical picture that American English, not always, but quite a lot of the time you find that American English is changing faster than British English and is also somewhat ahead of British English in, in that particular um, process. Um, and what I mean by being with a head is if you look at the figure here, this is the figure for frequency of the passive in the American Brown Corpus 1960, and that's almost identical to the frequency of the British Corpus flob for 1991. So just a generation ahead, as it were, the, the Americans are, are going faster and further than the Brits. It be interesting to look at the bigger picture, so I move to the bigger picture now, and so we see a decline. We can trace it back to 1931 and up to 2006. If we remember that this is not a true representation of 15 years, actually we would see a sharper decline here than the diagram actually shows. And once again we see the difference of uh, American English, sorry this is British English, uh, but American English has declined further and is uh, still a generation ahead of British English in the decline of the passive. Now, of course, the interesting thing to, which we would like to discuss insofar as we can is why? Why are these things happening? Um, historical linguists have often avoided the question of why, <laughs> simply because it's too difficult to answer. But let's try and answer it anyway and see how we get on. One of them I've already mentioned, one type of explanation these are really explanations for increase in frequency, and so they're not obviously applicable to the decline of frequency that uh, I've been illustrating. 
Um, the first one then is grammaticalization, the process of turning lexical material into grammatical material. And I'm going to show you another example of that, the so-called semi-modals, like be going to as a future, as a quotes, future tense, which has been developing in English. And then we have the process of colloquialization, which I've already just mentioned briefly, adapting written language towards spoken norms. So the theory here is that a lot of change actually takes place in the spoken medium, but then it, after perhaps a time lag or so, it gets converted into the written form. Um, not always, but at least to some extent that happens. And um, one example of this is negative contractions, or in fact verbal contractions generally, the fact that we can use cannot or can't, we can use the contracted form and traditionally everybody's been saying that can't is the form that is used in speech and if you're, if you're writing English you shouldn't use the contraction, you should use the full form cannot and similarly with will not, won't um, and so on. But what we find is that there's a great increase in the use of these verbal contractions in the written language and this has been increasing over the last hundred years it's at quite a re steady rate and so one explanation for that is this colloquialization the, the, the way in which written English gradually adopts the habits of speech and then I've mentioned also Americanization the fact that British English, being a smaller and more conservative country, nevertheless is influenced by American English. And uh, American English follows a particular pattern and we find that British English often follows it after a short time uh, delay. Um, did you guys eat yet? Actually, we don't use this kind of expression in British English yet, but I expect we will soon. We certainly use the word guys a lot more than we used to when I was a young student. Okay, and then we come to densification of content. Packing more meaning into less space, for example, press headlines. PM slams Labour Party leader. PM is, is, of course, a brief for the Prime Minister. Slams is a brief word meaning um, attacks verbally. Labour Party leader, of course. It's, it's a very concise way of expressing meaning which we get superbly in press headlines and which we also find in press writing generally. News writing tends to have this dense densification effect, which we also find extending to other varieties of English, not just journalism, but to uh, other forms of written language and even to the spoken language, and we'll have a look at that later on. And there are other possible facilitators of change. Um, prescriptivism, um, for example, um, using the relativizer that rather than which. I'm going to come to that one in a minute. And democratization, for example, we no longer make such use of Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Miss. Those have been on the decline a lot because people are now using a method of address simply by um, first name. And um, in fact, when I went to Starbucks coffee in Prague last night, they asked me, what's my first name? As if that's important when you're buying a cup of coffee. But I discovered that it's, the reason is that they can then write your name on, on the cup and then you will get the right cup of coffee. Hoping that you don't have the same first name as somebody else. <laughs> so here we have the habit of first name address standing all over the place. And that word messers, you know, which I showed you in that illustration before 1901 English, hardly ever used this plural of, of mister. So we have various explanations. Some of them are socially driven. Um, most of them, in fact, are social, driven by social factors, I think. But um, grammaticalization is an exception because that's also driven by internal factors such as um, elision, ellipsis, and a merger of linguistic forms.
Right, we're turning to this one, restrictive relative clauses, another apparent case of colloquialization. So, if we look at the first two, the woman to whom you were talking and the woman you were talking to, the equivalent ways of expressing um, relative clause, but of course we can use the one so-called pipe piping construction with the preposition first or the so-called standard preposition construction with the preposition then. Now which of those do you think is increasing and which is decreasing? Hmm? The second one. Second one is de increasing. increasing. Right, you're right. Yes, this one is increasing and more, ne more significant, this one is decreasing. And then we come to the, these three here. You can use um, which, that, or sometimes you can use zero relativization. You can say the matter which you mentioned, the matter that you mentioned, the matter you mentioned. So which of those do you think is decreasing? It is clear. Which? The third one is increasing. Right. Third one is increasing. What about this one? Which? Decreasing, good. And what about that one? Do you think it's increasing? Hmm? Ah, oh, I have caught you out at last. Okay, you got most of the right answers, but not over that. And what is the reason for that declining? This is the interesting point. There's a so-called sacred that rule um, in Zwicky's language log, 2005, that's his American English. Um, he wrote a, a really um, brilliant attack on what he calls the sacred that rule, which is the rule which has been enforced by language gurus, um, people who have authority quotes over the language in the USA. They may be editors of journals, they may be um, uh, teachers of freshman English in colleges, they might be people who write articles in newspapers about how to use your language. But these people collectively have enforced this so-called sacred that rule which says in a restrictive relative clause thou shalt not use which, thou shalt use that. <laughs> and you find that if you uh, use a modern uh, uh, word processors, you know, word windows, that sort of thing. If they often tell you, you know, do you really want to use which? Oh no, you shouldn't use which, you should use that. <laughs> and so, we see the decline of which. This is looking at which. And we see the decline in British English. American English, we only have the three data points, but we see the same trend. And of course, American English is further ahead in this decline than British English. But there's a strange kind of figuration. It looks like a pair of nutcrackers or something. This lozenge-shaped pattern here. And that is interesting because I think that shows real American influence because American English, American English really felt the force of this decline in the period 1961-1990. British English, not particularly influenced, but certainly it was influenced, I'd say certainly, I mean, I mean the influence in British English seemed to come later, as, as if British English is now uh, waking up and following the American League, and American English is still declining, but not so steeply. And um, th the reverse of that picture is found with that as a relative, right? The matter of that you mentioned. We see American English is far ahead in the frequency of that as relativizer, and it was particularly steep in 1961 to 1991, but still continuing. And British English uh, not very noticeably increasing at all until the period after 1991. So again, after a time lapse, the British English follows the American lead. Um, now, last, uh, not my last topic, but um, it's about time. Um, five to ten minutes. Five to ten minutes, okay. I'll try and cover the last few topics rather quickly. Um, Declining frequency of modals and the growing frequency of semimodals. Here I've compressed two trends in one diagram. I'm showing you here 
a declining frequency of modal auxiliaries, by which I mean the central class of modal auxiliaries in English, will, would, can, could, may, might, uh, shall, should, and must, and ought to as well, they have declined uh, particularly since about 1960s and there's another class of verbal constructions which have modal function but they are increasing at least rather slowly and I call those semi-modals other people have used different terms like Krug called them emergent modals, a slightly different class. They're not very well defined. I think the British English modal class is well defined, but the semi-modal is not so well defined. I just choose nine different semi-modals here. And, um, well, you see, British and American English are more or less the same there. But in this one, again, you see the familiar pattern of American modals declining faster and further ahead in that pattern than British English. I here use the corpus of um, Mark Davis. I don't know if any of you looked at this corpus of Mark Davis's um, called Koha, cor Corpus of Historic American English, an enormous corpus which you can uh, consult online in his uh, on his website at uh, Brigham, Brigham Young University and here we find the same pattern actually the decline only really seems to have set in later in the 20th century uh, but that's American English and if we look at particular these are in British English actually particular modals we have um, will um, may, must, shall, just examples. These are modals which have been declining particularly fast compared with others. Some others are remaining more or less the same. And um, I, won't, uh, I won't spend much time on this, but there are particular reasons why we might say these are declining, uh, particular modals which are declining like need, needn't, you needn't have worried, you ought to remember. We shall demonstrate. And one of the reasons is that there's so little you can do. They are so inflexible. There's just one form you can use. And uh, they're almost like an invariable particle. You know. And you can't use them as a finite verb anymore. And shall also has another symptom of this decline, which is that it can only occur in limited contexts, like the use of um, shall as a first, with first person subjects, uh, and also with um, third person subjects, but only in uh, rather legalistic contexts, in different types of texts. So these, these are only found in particular parts of the corpora I'm concerned with. Right, so if we take must as a particular example, must has been declining very steeply, uh, and again we see that American English is ahead of British English. But, and, uh, sorry, this is, this is, uh, this is need, um, going on to need to. Now this is a very different case because need to is a finite verb construction. It's one of what I call the semi-modals rather than of the pure modals. And we, we also have have to, have to and need to. In a way these are apparently taking over many of the functions which used to be earlier conveyed by must. I'm not saying must is, is, is dead or anything like that, but must is gradually being superseded, I would suggest, by forms like have to and need to. Have to goes up like this in British English and then comes down a bit, which is quite an interesting thing, maybe a challenge to explain. One possible explanation, because must have to, on the whole, has increased enormously over the last 70 or 80 or 100 years, but um, maybe it's coming down now because of the increase of need to. This is the one down here. Need to is increasing such a lot, and maybe uh, in that sense it's 
competing with have to as another uh, way of expressing obligation or necessity in present day English. Okay, I won't spend any more time on this, but just say it's very difficult to find data which can do similar comparisons with spoken language, but there is the diachronic corpus of present-day spoken English, of British English, that is to say, which was um, created at the Survey of English Usage in London under Professor Burke originally, and then by Sidney Greenbaum, and then by Bath Art present day successor to Quirk and they have produced this diachronic corpus not enormously large but it's a spoken language which is difficult to find any other data of the same kind um, there's no American corpus that can do the same thing all I show you here is that between the 1960s and 1990s we have decline of modals and the rise of semi-modals is much more commensurate with the decline of regular modals than you will find in the written language. In the written language we found that the semi-modals were only increasing slightly whereas the modals were declining quite significantly. But here we find similar amount of change. And uh, so probably in speech then, the semi-modals are taking a much more uh, significant part in the expression of modality than it was true of uh, in the written language. Um, right, I think it's time for me to stop because if I spend time on densification we won't have time. Um, so I want to just briefly describe what happens here. We've got um, increasing density of nouns. This is in press, supremely in press, but also in the other varieties of written language and even in the spoken language this increase of density of nouns and the, you see it in the way um, you get noun noun sequences uh, just look at an example like this and uh, the fruit of the coconut palm would be expressing the idea by use of preposition prepositional phrases coconut palm fruit is using the genitive which has also increased a lot and using simply ju noun juxtaposition you can simply say coconut palm fruit these are roughly equivalent but of course there are a lot of cases which are not equivalent just to show you how this type of expression has been increasing we go to the, this picture of noun noun sequences American English, British English, in this case, somewhat catching up the American habit. Now, now sequences are increasing. And prepositional phrases are decreasing. Uh, we see um, decline of prepositional phrases up here. British and American English more or less the same. And increase of now noun sequences here is compressed into a smaller uh, band, frequency band so it doesn't look quite so dramatic but you'll see the general picture that just as the prepositional phrases are decreasing the noun, phrase, noun combinations are increasing so that brings me to my last point um, why The evidence considered today is consistent with the assumption that the declining use of linguistic forms is simply the negative side of processes which lead to the increasing use elsewhere in the language. The positive determinants of change, such as grammaticalization and colloquialization, are explanations for positive change which indirectly may provide explanations for negative change. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your most interesting and uh, stimulative talk. I think we all um, 
will go back or will bring back home uh, uh, one thing that's um, how to carefully use corpus evidence and how to look for explanation uh, for any of the uh, of uh, corpus evidence so thank you very much uh, thank you very much for for that now I will open the floor for discussion from the audience yes Sylvia do you think that uh, the present English is uh, that we non-native speakers contribute to the changes of the present day English by the vast amounts of texts we are forced to produce in English? Um, well, for my own research, of course, I've been focusing mainly on native speakers' varieties, so I can't say very much about that, actually. But um, I think it is quite likely that that is happening and that it will happen in, in, in more in the future. You know. um, the only... Well, there are various movements which could... Which, which could promote that kind of change and one of them is uh, interest in what is called um, ELF what does that stand for? it stands for English as a lingua franca right? so a lot of English in the world today a great deal proportion of the English used in the world today is used talking between non-native speakers and so it stands to reason that that variety tends to dominate in terms of frequency and perhaps it will make an influence upon the way the language is used. I don't yet have any clear evidence of that, but Europe is a good uh, area in which to make that kind of study, I think, don't you? Mm -hmm. And there's another, another sign which I remember my friend um, David Crystal, he's written a lot about this sort of thing, you know, and um, he said that he, he thinks it very likely that over the next, uh, well, I can't remember the, the way he actually expresses this, but the coming tendency will be for um, English to develop more syllable timing rather than stress timing. You know, people always say it's a stress time language, right? And um, because a lot of the non-native speakers using English around the world, uh, for example in Africa and in Asia and in some parts of Europe are syllable time language, then they will eventually, um, as it were, uh, out uh, outperform the native speakers. <laughs> but uh, I'm not so convinced of that. I mean, it's very difficult to think ahead, isn't it? But um, so far, I don't find very much sign of this. But I mean, uh, there, are, there are small things like um, in European English, people use the word responsible, irresponsible, as a noun. Uh, and that seems to become quite established, for example, in EU fundraising. Uh, I am responsible for this. But that is not a native speaker expression. So in some respects you might say um, non-native speaker in a small way is increasing there. But I'd like to you know, invite other people the suggestions on that. So if you have any ideas, let me know. Actually, there was one uh, information in your on your slides which uh, surprised me because I, what I can observe in uh, the papers our students uh, write or abstracts, uh, I mean, as non-native speakers of English, uh, that I can observe a quite evident tendency in using a noun a noun. Uh, Congregations. Yes. Oh, right. mm. And I must say I fight against that because yes. I have the feeling that this is a, a kind of influence from American English, I Could thought. Yes. But on your data, you have, I think you have uh, um, one of the slides showed that this is not so, that the, the well, noun nine sequence is not that 
much more frequent in American English than in British English. So exactly, I don't yes. think... Uh, it seems as if British English is carry, catching up a bit. Um, and um, it would be nice if we had an earlier period for American English because this now now sequencing habit seems it's often attributed to American journalism. American newspapers in the, towards the beginning of the 20th century developed this habit and ever since then it's been catching on and spreading its influence. Um, but uh, another uh, corpus linguist, Douglas Biber, written about this um, and um, he says that there's a, a, there's a cut off point, what's the word, a, a kind of ceiling at which it's, it's no longer um, functional, functionally um, appropriate to increase noun noun sequences because um, you're fighting there are two forces actually. One of them is what I call densification. And the other one is colloquialization, which is to make it more like speech. Now in speech this densification is counterproductive. You cannot express your meanings in a way that other people can easily decode. So um, his idea is that to make the, the message accessible, you cannot go too far along this track. But um, if you want to compress your information, because after all we live in a world of information uh, explosion, we have to somehow cope with enormous amounts of, of information, and one way to do it is to use this compression strategy. But the compression strategy works against the uh, accessibility of the method. That, that's one idea. Mm. Uh, in one of your slides, you uh, actually showed that the uh, rate of disappearance of modals is yes. faster yes. than the rise of uh, semi-modals. Does that mean uh, that uh, actually expressing modality in this way is decreasing in English? This is one question and something that has something to do with it, maybe has something to do with it. Uh, this is quite a new information. A couple of weeks ago in Nature, in the scientific reports in Nature, there was a there was an information actually found a finding uh, based on Google Books, which may not be uh, the best reliable uh, source and so on and so on, but it's, mm. uh, it's, it's very extensive. Mm. Uh, the finding was that the uh, rate at which uh, words are disappearing from English is consistently decrease, uh, increasing while the rate at which uh, uh, new words are introduced into English is consistently decreasing, which means that our language uh, would be poorer and poorer and poorer. <laughs> so I don't know whether this has something to do with it. I don't know. Uh, they did not draw any uh, they did not yeah. draw any conclusions based on yeah, these yeah. findings. But uh, yeah. it's a very interesting trend yeah. that, up, uh, according to them, lasts from uh, the 19th uh, century up to up to uh, now. Well, I'm just uh, mystified by your second uh, report about decreasing neologisms and increasing obsolescence of words. I'm just extremely surprised, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to interpret that or even whether to believe it or not. <laughs> uh, but going back to the first one, really, your question was where have all those modals gone to? Because if, if the core modals are declining and the uh, semi-modals, which look like a replacement or a competing paradigm of verbs, uh, like be going to, have to, need to, want to, all those, you know. Why, so they are increasing, some of them are increasing a lot, but others are not particularly increasing, and they don't seem to be making their way very much, at least compared with the decline of modals, they are not making their way into the written language. And, um, well, I tried to find the answer to this by looking at other lexical, mainly lexical expressions which express modality, like uh, is it necessary or um, 
obligatory, a lot of, lot of nouns and adjectives that do express modality in a, in a less frequent form. On the whole, those are not particularly frequent, and um, I made a long, long list of those words and found that they were actually decreasing, quite contrary to my expectations. So you cannot really say that, well, those missing modals are being expressed by, by uh, new expressions of modality which have not been taken account of in, in, that, in those, verbs, those verb constructions. So, um, yeah, so that's not the answer. Part of the answer, at least I think, is colloquialization combined with grammaticalization. Now, we, we, we think of grammaticalization as taking place mainly in the spoken language, where you get those reductions, uh, things like gonna instead of going to, and be going to, and uh, wanna instead of want to, and so on. But that, that's a typical effect of grammaticalization which we find with these semi-modal. So, they are increasing because grammaticalization is associated with increase in the frequency of semi, of, of, um, of the forms which are being grammaticalized. And, so, if that is happening in the most informal styles of English speech, then you could argue that the deficit of modals is due to the fact that it takes time for that effect to filter into the written language. So, grammaticalization explains why this competition is getting more severe, as it were, from the semi-modals. But, um, colloquialization explains why they are reaching the written language but not to the same extent as the spoken language. So that might be part of the explanation. Um, that's, um, yeah, um, Yes, I, I just mentioned in this connection that uh, I made a study of uh, two very large I say very large, but mediumly large corpora of spoken English. Which one of them is the spoken part of the British National Corpus, BNC. The other part is the Longman Corpus of Spoken American English, which is roughly comparable to the, to the British Corpus, collected under the same circumstances. By comparing those, I found that in that most conversational an extemporary style of English, the semimodals were very, very much more frequent than in the other corpora that we looked at. So, those growth, the growth of the going to, want to, and if you like, gonna, wanna, gotta, <laughs> have to, all those forms are increasing enormously in American conversation, uh, such that uh, they are very frequent. We can't tell whether they've increased from their, that data because it's not diachronic, but they're very, very frequent in that um, spoken data, which is actually from the 1990s. And so, if you think that that must have increased in spoken American English, often we think of spoken American English as the um, bellwether of new usage. You know, new things come from American speech. <laughs> so it may be that, that these other effects are um, being indirectly coming from American speech, but they don't show that same dramatic increase that we find. i just to give you an example. I mean, must, which is a good traditional model for expressing obligation and necessity, is less frequent than, it's an American conversation, it's less frequent than have to, got to, and need to. Those three are much more frequent ways of expressing obligation and necessity than using must. So that's the way things may be going. But I also think there's um, an effect which I, I sometimes call, um, oh gosh, what do you call now? Um, press, prestige barrier. Okay, prestige barrier. The prestige barrier is still a residual feeling which people have that um, written English is more serious and more standardized, and it should be more serious and standardized than speech. So a lot of the forms which 
um, occurring speech do not easily get transferred to written media. A, a classic example is the verb get, which probably everybody who's gone through an English education has been told, don't use get in a written form. You know, it's somehow reserved for speech. It's felt not to be serious. It's too colloquial to come into written, written medium. And that might be also true of gotta, 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 because that comes from get or so. And um, some other forms like you better, you better go. Those are, those are so colloquial that they don't even get into written form through colloquialization. So various ideas, but no absolute answer to that. Question, uh, which concerns the causative conjunctions. Yeah. Have you, uh, or the data you have given us, uh, seem not to be depend dependent on the position of these uh, connectors yeah. uh, in the sentence. And when I started to learn English, I was instructed uh, Mm. Not to use because at the beginning of the sentence. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now I can see it in texts which 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 I read, but still it just uh, when I saw all these four possibilities because scenes as four. Mm. Um, I, I mean, are the frequencies relative to the positions, or does it mean that, for instance, uh, because uh, disappears or stays mm. stable and scenes is also used uh, mm. within a clause or something like that? Well, um, as far as I remember now, this represented uh, only because following the matrix clause. I think that was true. Because otherwise it wouldn't be um, equivalent to, it would be a different function from uh, 4, you see, because we can't begin 4. And I think that's true also of these. So I don't think I counted, uh, included those initial um, clauses. But I think that rule of yours is interesting. Don't begin a sentence with because. <laughs> because I think that the reason for that is that in spoken language we often begin as if a new sentence, even a new utterance with because. You say, um, get me a cup of tea because I'm thirsty. <laughs> and because it begins almost like a new sentence. And um, that's of course, it's not considered to be good written English to begin a sentence, which is actually the whole sentence consists of a because clause. There's no main clause. That's considered to be wrong, wrong in written language. So um, that might be that the reason for that rule. I've heard that rule being used in uh, English education, and I think it's because because uh, because people in speech actually do use because like um, but I call it hypertext it's obviously linked to the preceding context but you begin as if a new utterance with because but are no experts in uh, discourse annotation among us here but I want I, I remember we had a um, uh, workshop in Philadelphia just a week ago with yeah. people who uh, annotate discourse connectives yeah. or connectors mm. like mm. Joshi, Boniver and others mm. Mm. and I think they also had a very very low frequency of because at the beginning of the sentence mm. I mean of the sentence as such only yeah. at the beginning of a clause which is inside a compound sentence so I mean I took that observation which they mm. had mm. as a kind of support of my teachers yes. who taught me not to use because yes. at the beginning of the sentence well um, I, I, I said that it, because it, I believe it has become more paratactic link rather than hypertactic link that's the difference really and so um, we get very few initial becauses which contain a subordinate clause followed by the matrix clause we get three of those but we get many becauses with capital B um, particularly in transcribed speech for example 
where there's no main clause following. The post clause behaves like a main clause. Yeah. So, if there are no uh, questions, um, I would like first uh, to thank Professor Leach for coming and giving us uh, a wonderful talk, mm -hmm. and for all the uh, regular or irregular participants of our Monday seminar, I would like to say that this is the last one in this academic year, because next Monday uh, many of us local people uh, will be in Istanbul for the language resources and evaluation uh, conference and uh, we will open again in uh, October, the 8th of, 8th of October, again with Fred Jalinek series and the guest uh, for that talk will be uh, James Puskeyovsky uh, from Brandeis University. So I hope to have here are many of you again at that lecture. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.